Hello, my name is Chris Keith. I'm Professor of New Testament and Early Christianity at St. Mary's University Twickenham, where I also serve as the Director of the Center for the Social Scientific Study of the Bible. In this lecture, we're going to look at the Gospels and the person of Jesus Christ. The Gospels are fascinating, and I could talk about them for a long time, but to help you get prepared for your A-levels, in this lecture, we're going to cover their portrayals of Jesus, some of the introductory facts about them, uh, their portrayal specifically of Jesus as Son of God, as Teacher, and as Liberator. We're also going to look briefly at their depictions of his crucifixion and resurrection. To start with, and there's a bit of background on the Gospels. The earliest Gospels that we have, they're not the only Gospels, but the earliest ones we have are the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels that appear in Christian's New Testament. They are technically anonymous, uh, that is, within the, within the text themselves, within the gospel narratives. They never refer to uh, an author other than the Gospel of John, which refers to its author as the Beloved Disciple. They're never named uh, by name. Uh, but the, tradition of, the traditional authors of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, are attested in 2nd century manuscripts and in uh, the writings of the Church Fathers, and those uh, attestations go back to the second century. So we know that they were at least identified with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, by the second century, maybe earlier. Uh, their genre is typically identified as a modification of ancient biography. This has been argued most thoroughly in a recent book by Professor Helen Bond of the University of Edinburgh called The First Biography of Jesus. Previously, scholars uh, saw them as a variety of other types uh, of genres, but right now I'd say the consensus view is that they are some type of adaptation of ancient biography. In terms of provenance, the Gospels were all written in various locales in the ancient Mediterranean basin. We can't really say much more than that. Scholarly views uh, range from uh, some, seeing some Gospels as written in Jerusalem or elsewhere in Palestine, in Syria, sometimes uh, in Ephesus, or for example with the Gospel of uh, Mark, it's often associated with the city of Rome. We don't know any of this for sure, although there's a lot of different views on it. In terms of language, all the Gospels are written in Koine Greek. This was the popular level Greek in the first century in the Mediterranean, and it was popular because it had come in the wake of Alexander the Great's conquest. It's also the language that the, Jew the Greek translation of the Jewish scriptures, the Septuagint, is also written in. The Gospels are usually dated uh, to after the destruction of the temple by the Romans in 70 CE. Occasionally, there are arguments that some of the Gospels were written earlier, but most scholars view, as we'll see in just a second, the Gospel of Mark as the very first Gospel and date it to sometime uh, around or after the destruction of the Temple in Jerusalem. The oldest copies of the Gospels that we have, the oldest actual handwritten manuscripts like you saw on the previous slide, date to the 2nd century CE. The four Gospels that appear in the New Testament, and by far the most well-known Gospels, are the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are also our earliest Gospels. But they weren't the only Gospels. There were somewhere around 40 Gospels written uh, by followers of Jesus in early Christianity. And some others include the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas, the Infancy Gospel of James. There's also an Infancy Gospel of Thomas, or the Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Mary, there are a lot of Gospels, uh, but the four earliest ones are the ones that are in the New Testament. Each of the four earliest Gospels follow the same general outline. They start with Jesus' early career in Galilee, then they proceed to his trial and crucifixion in Jerusalem, and then narrate a variety of resurrection experiences among his earliest disciples. But we shouldn't let those similarities blind us to the fact that each of the Gospels is also different from the others in a variety of ways. They each have stories that the others don't have, sayings of Jesus that the others don't have, and they are distinct. Let's talk about the Gospel of Mark. The scholarly consensus since at least the early 20th century has been that Mark's gospel was written first, and then that the other gospels followed him. This stands in stark contrast to early church tradition, which was that Matthew was written first. But by and large, scholars today think Mark was written first, and there's not a whole lot of challenge to that idea. Some interesting facts about the Gospel of Mark. There's no birth narrative in the Gospel of Mark. So there's no baby Jesus. There's no 12-year-old Jesus. Jesus comes on the scene in the Gospel of Mark as a full-grown man. Uh, so there's no virgin birth in the Gospel of Mark, much like the Gospel of John. 
Another interesting fact is that, fact is that the end of Mark's gospel, where Jesus appears to the disciples in Mark 16, 9-20, which is known to scholars as the long ending of Mark, does not appear in many ancient manuscripts. Most scholars think that this was added later to the Gospel of Mark, and that the original version of the Gospel of Mark ended at Mark 16, 8, which says that they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Which offers us a little bit of an interesting thing. If, if as the Gospel of Mark says, the women were afraid and said nothing to anyone, how did we get the Gospel of Mark? Now, moving on to the Gospel of Matthew. As I mentioned earlier, Mark's Gospel is typically dated to around 70 CE. Scholars generally date Matthew's Gospel to around 80 to 85 CE. Why scholars take 10, 15 years, I don't know, but they just generally think that there needs to be enough time for Mark to have circulated and for whoever wrote Matthew to become familiar with it. So they give it 10 or 15 years. A couple interesting facts about the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew begins his story of Jesus with the story of the virginal conception and traces Jesus' genealogy to Abraham. So it's in Matthew, as well as Luke, that we get this long story uh, of, or this long account of Jesus' lineage. Furthermore, only Matthew tells the story of dead people who arose from graves and walked around the city of Jerusalem when Jesus died, sometimes funnily described as the Matthean zombies. Another interesting fact about the Gospel of Matthew is that based on citations in ancient manuscripts, Matthew was by far the most popular gospel in the early church. Now let's talk about the Gospel of Luke. Scholars usually date Luke's Gospel between 85 and 100. Most scholars think that both Matthew and Luke knew Mark and used Mark as a source. Then a smaller number of scholars think that Luke probably knew Matthew as well. But in general, scholars date Luke to shortly after Matthew, but before John. Uh, there are challenges to this. Some people see Luke as written much later than that. Interesting facts about Luke, Luke's gospel is the early tradition held that the author, Luke, was a companion of Paul, not Jesus. Furthermore, only Luke's gospel tells us the story of the 12-year-old Jesus going to Jerusalem and teaching the experts of the law. If you remember, his parents leave him in Jerusalem and then come back and find him teaching in the temple, only in Luke's Gospel. Now let's have a look at the Gospel of John. Scholars usually date John's Gospel to around 90 to 100 CE. And some interesting facts about the Gospel of John include that John's Gospel doesn't open with the story of Jesus' birth, much like Mark's Gospel. Unlike Mark's Gospel, John also doesn't start with Jesus just showing up as an adult at the beginning of his ministry. Instead, it asserts that Jesus was pre-existent with God and participated in creation by referring to Jesus as the Logos. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and what God was, the Word was. Only John's Gospel portrays a Jesus disciple confessing him directly as God. This happens from so-called Doubting Thomas in one of the resurrection narratives where Thomas refers to Jesus as my Lord and my God upon seeing his wounds. Also, the popular story of the woman caught in adultery in John 7, 53 to 8, 11 is not in the earliest copies of John's gospel. It is in the majority of uh, copies of John's gospel, but we don't have a copy of John's gospel uh, in the very early stages with this story. So like the long ending of Mark, this story was likely added to the Gospel of John after it began circulation in the early church. Now let's talk about the title Son of God, which is one of numerous titles that get used for Jesus in the Gospels. Some of you might have been told, like I was growing up, that Son of God referred to Jesus' divinity. This is and isn't true. The title itself doesn't necessarily refer to divinity. It was used for a long time before Jesus and often in relation to Israel's kings, which were thoroughly understood as human kings. This, for example, is the way that it's used in Psalm 2. The Gospels, however, do hint at Jesus' divine identity in other ways. They don't outright claim it, but they do indicate it by saying that Jesus does some things that only God was understood to do. For example, Jesus forgives sins in Mark 2, and the people around him say, how does he do this when no one can forgive sins but God? Similarly, Jesus walks on the water in Mark 6. We'll come back to some of these later, but in the Hebrew Bible, uh, there are numerous places where only God is said to be able to do this. 
in John 1. Uh, the auth gospel author, as we just mentioned, claims that Jesus pre-exists and created with God. So he again attributes to him things that only God did. Jesus also in John's gospel claims to be son of God in a way that doesn't refer to everybody else. In other words, they could refer to themselves as son of God the way that everybody is a son of God. But Jesus understood himself as son of God in a way that was unique and that becomes problematic in John's gospel. So in other words, the son of God did not in and of itself refer directly to divinity, uh, the divinity of Jesus. But that doesn't mean that the gospel authors don't assert that in a variety of other ways. Let's talk about two stories in the Gospels where Jesus' authority is on display, and they're both different kinds of authority. The first is the calming of the storm in Mark 6. In this story, the disciples are crossing the Sea of Galilee, which is not like a pond, but a very big bottle, body of water. And Jesus is not with them. A, st a storm comes up on the sea, and the disciples are concerned for their safety. Jesus is seen by them uh, walking across the water. And when he gets there, he tells them, as they are very afraid, fear not, it is I. But Mark's done something slick here, because in Greek, the phrase it is I could also be read as I am. And I am, as we'll see shortly, was the divine name. This is important because in numerous Hebrew Bible texts of the Old Testament, it asserts that only God can control the weather. So Mark, again, is being slick here. He doesn't necessarily have Jesus say, hey, I'm God, guys. But he does have him do something that only God was said to do and use the divine name in the midst of doing it. Another example of a story where Jesus' authority is on display is in the healing of the man born blind in John chapter 9. In this story, Jesus' authority is pitted against the Jewish leadership, which is opposing him and labeling him a sinner. Jesus heals a man at the beginning of the story. Uh, of his, uh, He get, grants him his sight back. And then they ask the man, the Jewish leadership asks the man, who is Jesus? And Jesus and the man says, I don't know. I just know that I was blind and now I see. But by the end of the very long conflict, which brings his parents and everyone else into it, the man ends up confessing Jesus, saying, I believe. The, story, the point of the story is that sometimes conflict drives people to faith. So Jesus' authority here is manifested as a very different kind of authority than the authority of the Jewish leadership he's opposing. Was Jesus a teacher? To this question, we can confidently say yes. Jesus was frequently referred to as rabbi, which was a title for teachers. Jesus' authority was also frequently challenged by other teachers, which was important because even though they disagreed with Jesus and they wanted to challenge his authority, they at least recognized him as a teacher whose authority needed to be challenged and thus as a teacher. But for Jesus' followers, Jesus was not just a teacher, but the only teacher. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 10, uh, Jesus instructs his followers that they only have one teacher to the extent that they should not refer to anyone else as teacher. For this and more, you can see uh, on Jesus' uh, relationship with other teachers and the conflict between them, I'd refer you to my own book, uh, Jesus Against the Scribal Elite, The Origins of the Conflict. Some of Jesus' famous teachings include the antitheses of Matthew chapter 5 and the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. Let's discuss these briefly. The antitheses of Matthew chapter 5 in 17 to 48 occur within a section of teaching, one of probably the most famous section of Jesus' teaching called the Sermon on the Mount. This is where Jesus says things like, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the merciful, etc. He also in this makes clear that he has expectations that exceed the requirements of the Torah, the Jewish law. For example, he says, you've heard it said in ancient times that you shall not murder. But I tell you that if you're angry with a brother or sister, that you're liable to judgment. Here we see an escalation of what's required. You can, in strictly speaking, according to the Torah, you could hate someone in your heart just so long as you don't murder them. But Jesus says if you hate them in your heart, then you're guilty of the same sin as murder. So there's a real ratcheting up of the seriousness. But Jesus is stressing that what's going on inside the person, in their inner spirit, so to speak, is as important as their actions and connected to their actions. Another place where Jesus is concerned with what we might call internal purity is in the parable of the prodigal son, 
This occurs in Luke 15, the story of the lost, uh, the lost things. So it starts out with the story of a widow who lost a coin. Then there's also uh, another story, and then Jesus eventually gets to the parable of the lost son, or in common parlance, the prodigal son. In this story, there's a rich man, and one of his sons asks for uh, his inheritance, and he goes off and squanders it and ends up working with pigs. This was a big deal for Jews because pigs were unclean animals, so this would have been a man who was impure. But then he goes back and asks his father to treat him like one of his slaves. Instead of doing so, rejecting him or taking him back as a slave, his father welcomes him back with open arms and reinstates him as one of his sons on equal footing with the son who never left. The point of the story is that the, that the father, that is God, uh, accepts people back even when they do things that they shouldn't as long as their heart is sincere. Now let's talk about Jesus as a liberator. Jesus was widely remembered in the Gospels and portrayed as a champion for the poor, the outcast, women, and other marginal groups. In a variety of stories in the Gospels, Jesus befriends or at least admonishes or presents as a hero someone who uh, would have broken uh, the purity laws or who would have lived in a state of outside the purity laws. Uh, in Leviticus, the purity laws... Uh, are detailed, but what they say is anytime anything on the inside of your body gets out, it renders you impure. So let's look at the hemorrhaging woman of Mark chapter 5. This is a woman who has essentially a perpetual menstrual flow. And if you look at the Levitical purity laws, anytime that it, a woman is in the midst of menstruation, she uh, is rendered impure, and there is a variety of processes that she needs to go through to have her purity restored. So this woman would have been rendered perpetually impure as long as she had this physical ailment. She touches Jesus' robe, though, and is healed. And Jesus feels it and admonishes her faith. Another example is the Good Samaritan. Now, Samaritans and Jews were in uh, an ethnic battle with each other. They didn't like each other, and it was a very long-standing dislike. And in the story, the Good Samaritan is is good because he stops and helps a man who was left for dead on the side of the road after being beaten. So we can assume that he was bloody. And any time that anything like blood on the inside of your body gets on the outside, he would have been impure. So we learn in the story that both a priest and a Levite pass by the man on the other side. They pass by because they're going probably to the temple and they don't want their state of purity ruined by the man who is in a state of impurity. But a Samaritan, not a Levite, not a Jew even, from their perspective, uh, comes by and he helps the man, takes him to lodging and pays for him, and thereby would have rendered himself impure in the process. But the heroes of both of these stories are unexpected heroes because they were social outcasts. So we see here Jesus casting the outcast in the role of hero. As I mentioned earlier, only the Gospel of John has a character within the story identify Jesus as God. Downing Thomas refers to Jesus as my God and my Lord. But the authors do, as I also mentioned earlier, hint at the idea of Jesus' divinity in a variety of ways. We earlier saw that they portray him as sometimes doing things that only God did, and we're going to look shortly at how in some ways he occupies positions that only God is supposed to occupy. One prominent way that the Gospel authors hint at Jesus' divine identity is by using I am statements. I am is important because it's the divine name that God revealed to Moses in Exodus 3.14 when he tells him that when he tells Moses to tell the Hebrew people that I am sent him. Uh, the point there being that as opposed to false idols who don't really exist, Moses' God exists. He I am. He is. So Mark's gospel, we already looked at how he does this in at least one way. When, he's, when Jesus is crossing the water and he eventually gets in the boat and the disciples are afraid in Mark chapter 6, he says, Take heart, it is I, which can mean I am. Do not be afraid. So Mark portrays Jesus as using the divine name while doing something that according to several of the Hebrew scriptures, only God did. Mark also, at Jesus' trial, 
As Jesus asked, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus answers. Most English translations will tell you it is I, but again, it's I. He, in Greek, it's literally I am. I am, and you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. At that point, they accuse him of blasphemy. So it's very clear that the audience, Jesus' immediate audience in the narrative, interprets this as a claim for Jesus' divinity. John's Gospel ratchets this up quite considerably. He has a number of I am statements. For example, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I am the true gate. Uh, I am the great shepherd. He has Jesus use an unadorned I am when he says, before Abraham was, I am. There he claims pre-existence by using the divine name. Uh, he also has Jesus claim, I'm the resurrection and the life just before he resurrects Lazarus, or he claims in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So John portrays Jesus using the divine name throughout his ministry. Let's look briefly at Jesus' death. Although it is very commonly uh, said that Jesus was killed by Jews, technically Jesus was crucified by Romans, specifically the Roman procurator Pontius Pilate. In Jerusalem, or outside Jerusalem around Passover. The titulus over his head that reads King of the Jews indicates why he was crucified. They viewed him as a, as a political threat, as a claimant to being uh, the Jewish king. The cru his crucifixion alongside other insurrectionists indicates the same. They crucified Jesus as a political dissident or a political threat alongside other individuals deemed political threats. Now, crucifixion in the ancient world was reserved for slaves, non-citizens, and traitors to the Roman Empire. That's who Rome crucified. And that tells us, therefore, a lot about how uh, the Romans viewed Jesus and why they crucified him. The resurrection accounts are one of the most fascinating things in the Gospels. And many, many, many books have been written on the resurrection of Jesus. We can only look briefly at it. All the earliest sources agree that the women were the first witnesses to the resurrection and that they went back and told the male disciples. Mark's Gospel's original ending has Jesus promising to meet the disciples back in Galilee, but he doesn't narrate it. As we talked about earlier, the 16, 9-20 isn't in the earliest manuscripts and was likely added later. Matthew's Gospel has Jesus meet the disciples post-resurrection on a mountain in Galilee. As opposed to the other Gospels, Luke's Gospel has Jesus meet the disciples in and around Jerusalem, not Galilee. John's Gospel has Jesus go back to Galilee as well after the resurrection, where he meets with the disciples where on the Sea of Galilee or on the shore, where they had returned to fishing. In this lecture, we've covered the Gospels in their portrayal of Jesus. We've looked at their genres and dates of composition. The earliest one being 70 CE, the latest one probably being around 100 or later, the Gospel of John. The, we also looked at their portrayals of Jesus as divine, as a teacher, and as a liberator. We also looked at some of the content of Jesus' most famous teachings, and we also looked at the crucifixion and res resurrection. Here are a couple resources that I mentioned in the course of the lectures that will help you take next steps toward further studies. Helen Bond's The First Biography of Jesus and my own book, Jesus Against the Scribal Elite, The Origins of the Conflict.